Welcome 13th jurors. Brandy Churchwell here and I've got a wild case for y'all. This is the story of an investigation and a case that has been ongoing for 15 years. One man, six wives. Four of those wives are now dead and three were by suspicious means. This week we begin what will be the third murder trial for the man who has become known as the widower. This is the unbelievable true story of Thomas Randolph. This investigation begins in Las Vegas on the evening of May 6, 2008. Tom and Sharon Randolph have just spent an evening out on the town together. They went to dinner at a local casino, gambled for a little bit, and then walked through the parking lot toward their car, seemingly happy and holding hands. They pull up to their home around 8.30 p.m. Tom said that he opened the garage door, Sharon got out and went inside, and he finished pulling the car in the garage and then went inside himself. At 8.45 p.m., a call comes in to 911. Tom tells dispatchers that his wife has been shot in the head. He's breathing heavy, he's grunting, and he sounds like he's crying at one point as he's calling out her name. According to Tom, when he walked in the house, he saw Sharon's body laying on the floor and thought she had just fallen. He then sees a masked intruder who comes toward him. They struggle for the gun, which causes his mask to come up slightly so that Tom can see who it is. He said the intruder's name is Mike Miller, a man that he claims he knows because Mike has ripped him off before. He said that when he got the gun, he began shooting Mike and kept on as he ran toward the garage. When the dispatcher asked Tom, is he hurt too? Tom responded, I hope he's dead. Police arrive and begin to take in the scene. There are drawers open, a bunch of jewelry in a bag that's laying by Mike's body, and takeout food laying on the floor from the restaurant that Tom and Sharon had been at that evening. With Sharon Randolph and Mike Miller both lying dead on the floor of the Randolph home, police ask Tom to come to the station to conduct an interview. At 12.14 a.m., Tom walks into the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department to answer questions about the events of the evening. He tells detectives that he has known Mike Miller for about four or five months because Mike had been doing handiwork for him. He says that Mike did know that they were going to dinner at the casino that night, and he said that Mike also knew that Tom kept cash on him. He tells detectives his version of events again, and at first it seems like it was just a robbery gone wrong. As he's walking out, Tom looks over to Detective O'Kelly and says, is your wife good looking? And Detective O'Kelly takes just a second and he said, what do you think? And Tom said, to kill for. Now, if you are being interrogated or interviewed or talked to by police about possibly killing your wife, don't you think that that might be one of those jokes that you just don't throw out there? Well, not for Tom Randolph. Sharon Randolph had one daughter. Her name is Colleen Byer. Colleen was at home when she got a call from one of her mom's friends who said that she saw on the news there had been a shooting on Sharon Street. Colleen had just talked to her mom about two and a half hours before the murders. Worried about what was happening, she drove to her mom's house. She saw the police cars and lights, and she said she just knew. Sharon raised Colleen in New Jersey. She said it was just the two of them. They moved to Vegas so that Sharon could have better job opportunities. She got her beauty license and began doing hair. She got a job at a beauty salon where she met another hairdresser named Alice Wolf. Alice and Sharon became great friends. Alice described Sharon as really funny and down-to-earth. Alice remembers first hearing about Tom through Sharon when she found him on Match.com. She said that he was a special education teacher, but apparently wasn't working at the time. He was living in Utah, and Sharon showed Alice a picture of him and said that she really wanted to meet him. Tom came to Vegas, and he and Sharon went to a concert together, and Alice said that Sharon fell head over heels in love with him. He wanted to take her on a three-day cruise, and they came back and... Sharon told Alice that they got married. To Colleen and Alice, it seemed like Sharon was really happy with Tom. He had a boat that they went out on, and they did a lot of traveling together and were always doing fun things. 
Colleen said that her mom just kind of showed up to her house one day with Tom and she didn't really know what to think. She said that he had this long, crazy blonde hair and suddenly he was just there. But her mom did seem really happy. So what happened to make police think that this happy couple could be torn apart by murder? Seven days after the murders, police arrange a meeting with Tom at the house to do a video walkthrough to get a clearer understanding of what happened. The video is bizarre, and Tom kind of seems intoxicated. He walks through the version of events for the police, acting things out. He said that he stopped the car in the driveway, and Sharon got out and went in the house. He finished pulling the car in the garage and then opened the door. He gets in there and said that Sharon's lying in the floor face down and he called her name tom said that he then saw a shadow or something and ducked into his office and got a nine millimeter semi-automatic he came back to the doorway and saw a masked man who he said rushed up on him and then he said he started shooting now at this point he's acting this out so he's yelling in the video boom 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 tom said the intruder went into the garage and he fell and was wearing his mask but it he was also making a noise he said that he came back in and he was calling for sharon and was kind of looking around to see if anyone else was there and then he got the cordless phone and called 911. Tom said that the dispatcher told him to put sharon flat on her back and he said that he tried to roll her over and he couldn't get it he was being really dramatic as he was acting this out for police and he was even duplicating the noises that he was making on the call now at the end of the walkthrough they asked about mike the explanation that he's giving as he's walking detective dean o'kelly through everything just isn't adding up first of all neighbor mark bartlett said that he was on the phone with a friend when he heard the gunshots he commented something about it to his friend, and he said that that was sometime around 8.30. Detectives were able to get Mark's phone records, and it showed that the call that he was on and the time that he heard the gunshots was actually about 8.33 p.m. Now, when Tom was asked how long it took from the time he opened the door until he called 911, he said two to three minutes. However, the 911 call didn't come in until about 8.45. That leaves somewhere around 12 to 15 minutes unaccounted for. Was he making sure that Sharon was already dead before calling for help? Another problem is the story about Mike, the intruder. There was no evidence of Tom shooting Mike in the hallway like he said. There was only one casing in the hallway, and the blood from Mike was pretty much all in the garage, not the hallway. The single casing could mean that maybe one shot was fired, probably as Mike was leaving the hallway to enter the garage, but it looks like everything else happened while he was already in the garage. Another thing, Tom said that when he shot Mike in the head, he still had a mask on, but he said it did come up just a little bit during the struggle, so he knew who it was. That's not possible though, because the mask was found on the ground with no bullet defects, no blood, and definitely not still on Mark. It looked to detectives like the intruder did shoot Sharon in the head, and then took his mask off, indicating maybe that he doesn't need to hide his face anymore, perhaps around someone familiar or non-threatening. Yet another problem was Tom contradicting himself. In his interview, he told detectives that he didn't hear the shot that killed Sharon. He said he's really deaf, but in the 911 call, he clearly said that he heard a shot. So what is true from Tom's story? Detectives were able to verify that the Randolphs went to dinner at Santa Fe Casino right down the street. They could be seen on security footage leaving the restaurant. They are then seen walking through the parking lot, even holding hands at one point as they make their way to their car. Tom had said that he went to a gas station to fill up and security footage shows that they did stop there and pulled out around 8.26 p.m., arriving home at 8.30 p.m. So up to that point, everything seems like it fits. They got home, Sharon got out and walked inside, and by the time Tom finished parking the car and walked in, Sharon was already lying on the ground. They believed that Mike shot Sharon in the head, but at this point, they still had no idea why or even how. 
In early June, 26 days after the murders, police brought Tom in for questioning. It was another bizarre interview. Tom tells detectives that while Sharon was this wonderful person and the best thing ever, he himself is a cocky MFR and always has been. He said he's also a smart MFR that he worked with criminal attorneys before. Detectives did later confirm this. Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing because of our audience. Tom was also saying things like, I don't like you to Detective O'Kelly. And then to the other detective, he was saying things about how he talked to him like he was his best friend. There was basically a lot of shock value stuff, but he also told them that unless they arrest him, he's not coming back for 30 to 40 days. The most bizarre part, however, was what he said to Detective O'Kelly when he was leaving. During the weeks following the death of her mother, Colleen said that she tried to act normal with Tom. She was struggling with this because she didn't believe his innocent act. Colleen said that she called Tom and asked, what did you do to my mom? She said that he replied, I didn't do anything to your mom. Mike shot and killed her. And then he hung up on her. Colleen pretended to believe Tom's story and even let him feel like he was still grandpa to her kids. But she said that she didn't believe any of it for a second. Tom had what he believed was Sharon's will, and he felt like everything Sharon had was now his. But not so fast. Remember Sharon's friend Alice? A few days after the murders, Alice gave Colleen another will that voided out the one that Tom had. Alice said that she was with Sharon when she wrote it out, and they went together to have it notarized. She told Alice that if anything happens to her, give this to Colleen. In the will, Sharon had left her house to Colleen. Now, this is a huge deal, and Colleen and Alice felt like maybe Sharon had to suspect something because she went behind his back and changed the will without him knowing. When Tom found out, he was furious. He started leaving nasty phone messages on Colleen's phone. He later called and left a message apologizing for getting so upset with her, but said that that's what happens when people look him in the eyes and lie to him. He said, now the lawyers are going to get all the money. He also said, I still get half of the house because I'm married to your mama. He told her, I forgive you. And he's sorry that he called her bad names. Meanwhile, detectives are still trying to figure out exactly what happened and why. Why would Mike Miller shoot Sharon Randolph? Mike's family is in North Carolina, so detectives headed out that way to talk to them, hoping for some answers or at least some leads. They spoke to Mike's brothers, Rufus and Rico. Rufus said that Mike told him that Tom had asked him to be a handyman for him for $600 a week. Rico told detectives that he talked to Mike before everything happened, and he said that he seemed like he was doing good working for Tom. But he does know that Mike had received a 9mm from Tom, but didn't know why. The next interview they did was with Mike's longtime friend, Judy Archie. Judy said that Mike talked to her a lot about Tom, and one day he called her and said, he told me he wants me to kill his wife. Judy said that she didn't know why, she didn't know what was offered to him. She didn't really know much about anything to do with it, other than he told her that Tom asked him to kill Sharon. She told him to go to the police with it. Now, this information is how detectives kind of started to piece together everything and lay out their theory. So here's what they came up with. Tom married Sharon to cash in on her life insurance when she died. They found four life insurance policies that he took out on her, totaling $360,000, and he was the beneficiary in all four. Tom met Mike and started grooming him to become willing to kill for him. Tom took Sharon out for Mother's Day to allow Mike to get into the house to prepare. They think Mike had a key and that he was in the bathroom waiting until she came in alone. As soon as she got there, he shot her. Tom came in. Mike took his mask off because at this point now he's comfortable. He has no reason to have it on. And when he started to leave, Tom ambushed him. That's why his mask was off and on the ground. About five weeks after Sharon's murder, Colleen was planning on changing the locks on the house. She was scared to go alone, so Detective O'Kelly went with her. Tom showed up and he was agitated. He said he didn't understand any of this. 
He asked if they had anything that said that he couldn't be there. And he said that this is his house and his address. And he said he is staying there. Detective O'Kelly said, no, that's not the way it's going to work today. Tom called the detective an a-hole and then told him that he's going in to go get his stuff. Detective O'Kelly told him no and said that he's got to work this out with his attorneys. The interaction really sh- really kind of shook up Sharon's daughter, Colleen, and made her really uncomfortable. A few weeks after that, detectives had gathered enough that they felt like they could go to the district attorney's office and present their case. They went to Clark County, and they were hoping to go in, tell them everything they knew, and get an arrest warrant. However, they presented the evidence. They said that it was planned over the course of probably about four or five months since Tom and Mike had met. And he said that he used Mike to do his dirty work and then got rid of the only witness. They gave all of the information about the witnesses they had spoke to, but because some of it is hearsay, the DA said that there's not really enough for them to take to trial. He said that there were strong conclusions, but not absolutes at this point. So, They decided to continue the investigation and start looking into the previous wives and relationships of Thomas Randolph. With six wives and marriages that had scattered all over the country, detectives had their work cut out for them. So they started with wife number one. Wife number one is Catherine. She's still alive, she's married, and she's living in Washington State. Catherine and Tom were married August 2nd of 1975. She was 18 years old and he was 20. They got married in Utah at his parents' house. Catherine said that she was really drawn to Tom's parents, that they were really good to her. Catherine and Tom had two kids, a boy named Justice and a girl named Krista. He didn't hold a steady job for very long, and there were early signs of problems. She said that she made him oatmeal one morning and didn't put sugar on it, so he threw it at the wall and made a comment about how his mom always put sugar on his oatmeal. He started harassing her and seeing other women and doing drugs and even started to deal drugs. He was arrested, but his parents bailed him out every single time. He had an insurance policy on her, and on April 7th of 1983, they divorced. She said that he got really scary and psychologically abusive, but not necessarily physically abusive. But he was very controlling, and she said definitely narcissistic. Catherine met her current husband, Steve, not long after her divorce from Tom. Steve was actually friends with Tom before them getting married. Now, Steve said that Tom asked him before what he would be willing to do for money, and asked him if he would kill someone for money if he knew that he could get away with it. Steve said that Tom actually asked him this several times. Now, this threw up red flags to the detectives because now they're starting to see maybe this is a pattern. Tom's second wife was named Becky. They were married in 1983, and she passed away, but her original investigation ruled her death a suicide. This was back in Clearfield, Utah. Now, Rosalie Allred is Becky's aunt and said that Becky had confided in her a good bit. Now, Rosalie did not like Tom. She said that he was an arrogant smartass. Becky talked to Rosalie and said that Tom had a room in the basement that he kept locked and he had other women down there and he would even have her sometimes go down there and make her watch him with other women. She didn't want to, but Becky said that, you know, it kills her to do it, but she loves him, so she did it. Now, they were having financial problems and were behind on rent. The lights were shut off. It was pretty bad. So they went to borrow some money from Rosalie. Now, Rosalie found a receipt where she loaned Becky $2,000 to get out of debt. She said that Tom used it to pay for their insurance premiums on their life insurance. So out of everything, his main priority was to keep their life insurance up to date, although they were both young and healthy. Now, Rosalie said that he had three policies on Becky, and he was the beneficiary for all of them. 
When you see the pictures of Becky, it's actually really sad. She had this huge electric smile, and in so many of her pictures, she was always smiling. Her family said that she was always smiling and that she was happy, and her happiness and her joy was just infectious to anybody around her. Her family said that when she first met Tom, that she seemed really excited and happy and thought that he was just great. He was a really smooth talker. Now, her cousin said that she thought Tom was kind of a show off, which was annoying. He was working for a law firm trying to become an attorney at the time. But at first, they did seem pretty happy. Things took a turn and the relationship got pretty bad. Becky's cousin asked her why she didn't just leave Tom, but Becky said that she was scared of what he would do to her if she did. She told her cousin one day that she was going to go to her house in Clearfield to pick up a few things, but Becky never made it back. She was shot in the head, and they said that she shot herself, but her family said there is no way she would do that. Detectives met with the original investigators who looked into Becky's death and also spoke to the deputy DA in Farmington, Utah. So the DA's name was Steve Major, and he said that he does remember going to the house. It was a newer house at the time, and when they got there, uh, she was upstairs in a bedroom. There was a suicide note left on the kitchen counter. She was lying on a waterbed and had a blanket over her looked to them like a suicide, so that's how they treated the investigation. The lead investigator, Dick Martin, interviewed with the detectives as well. Now, Dick felt like some things didn't add up. The position of the hands and where the gun fell, he didn't think anything like that made it look necessarily like a suicide. He had concerns and things felt odd to him. Now, the impression of the barrel on her head, he said, was abnormal, and she would basically have to be a contortionist to have pulled the trigger herself. He went back to investigate further and thought that the scene was secured by county attorney's office, but by the time he got the warrant, everything that he wanted to do was gone. Tom had come in and scoured the place clean. The carpet was pulled up. The walls were clean. Basically, every piece of evidence that he was hoping to find was gone. So Tom cashes in a life insurance policy over half a million dollars. Becky's death remained a suicide for the next couple of years until Scott Conley at Ogden, Utah Police Department got involved. Conley first heard of Tom because he wanted to be a major drug player in Ogden. He was apparently all about the movie Scarface and even wanted people to call him Tony Montana. Conley had a huge case file on Tom. One day, a woman called Conley and told him that her husband had been approached by Tom about killing Becky. Her husband's name was Eric Tarantino. Tom befriended Eric Tarantino years earlier and started to groom him to basically kill Becky. Eric and Tom were really close, and he was telling Conley that Tom had come up with four or five different plans to take Becky out and kill her for profit. Eric Tarantino became important in Becky's investigation. About three months after Sharon's murder, detectives flew out to New Hampshire to meet with Eric. Eric met Tom because he was the foreman at a cabinet shop that he was working at. He said that he admired Tom, but he kind of fell into his trap. He said that Tom started off by giving him odd jobs, different things for him to do, and then invited him to dinner, and they became like friends and got closer. Sometimes Eric collected money for Tom for the drugs that he was dealing to people on the street and also to police officers. Tom began planting seeds here and there and asking if Eric would be willing to kill someone for insurance money. And then finally, Tom came out one day and just flat out told him, I want you to kill my wife. They were shooting guns in the canyon and Tom had a 22 with a silencer. He said to Eric that he wanted him to kill his wife and Eric said no. Now, they had gone through all of these scenarios before about killing someone for insurance money and the different schemes, but he didn't know anything about it being Becky. Tom told him, well, now you know too much, so it's either you do it or you got to go. 
when Eric said no, he said that he actually became really fearful of Tom and no longer trusted him. And Tom became kind of crazy. He said that he used chloroform on him one time and Eric woke up and Tom was standing over him laughing. He would come in and hold guns to his head and Eric didn't know if they were loaded or not. Tom would then shoot and like hit a chair or something and Eric would be like, okay, well, I guess it was loaded. They had talked about all these different scenarios, like an accidental shooting or a car incident or a fire when she was sleeping. Eric felt like he couldn't turn to anyone because Tom was dealing drugs to police officers and to lawyers and basically to everyone that he felt like he could have talked to. Eric had become friendly with Becky, so he wanted to warn her. He called Becky and told her, Tom is going to kill you. He has insurance policies on you at his mom's house in the drawer, and I've seen them. Eric packed up and then ran after that. His wife called him about a year later and didn't say hello, didn't give any greeting, just said, she's dead. And Eric said he dropped the phone. On November 30th, 1988, two years after Becky's death, police arrested Tom for her murder. Her family became hopeful that there would finally be justice for what Tom did to Becky. Eric was a key witness in the trial, and Tom knew that, so he tried to have Eric killed. He had a conversation with what he thought was a hitman, but it turned out it was an undercover police officer. Eric was then put into protective custody. In April of 1989, they went to trial. During the trial, defense held firm that Becky's death was suicide, and prosecutors said, nope, it was murder. Eric said that there was a time when Tom jumped on the bed and began singing along with a Rod Stewart song. The lyrics were all about shooting his wife in the head and making it look like a suicide. Tom testified for over two hours and apparently delivered a long, rambling narrative where he talked about being married to Becky, who he described as disturbed, depressed, and dependent on drugs. Her family was frustrated by this because they said, yes, she had become dependent on drugs, but Tom is the one who got her addicted to drugs. Becky's family was waiting at the courthouse, and when they got called back in for the verdict and Tom was acquitted by the jury, in news interviews, they asked how he felt, and he smiled, and he said, wonderful. But Martha DeGraw, Becky's mom, told reporters that she thought it was very unfair and unjust and said that he's guilty. What's probably one of the most haunting parts of the interview is that at the very end, she said, he's just going to kill somebody else's daughter, so beware. Tom may have walked out of the courthouse thinking that he was scot-free, but they did still have him on conspiracy to kill Eric Tarantino. He pled guilty for that charge and served 18 months. He got out and then sued for being prosecuted. He sued Davis County, Ogden PD, and Clearfield PD, for libel and slander, so they paid him off. He literally gained monetarily for the whole event. The settlement came and he was gone. Wife number three is Leona and she goes by Lee. Now, Tom married Leona in 1994 and not much is known about her. The marriage only lasted for about 11 months before they divorced. About 10 years later, Leona died of cancer. Wife number four is Gaina, and they got married in 1995. Detectives went to interview Gaina in Indiana. She said that she met Tom through a personals ad for dating in the newspaper. They went out for a period of time, and he brought her flowers, and he seemed really nice. And she said that she was actually stupid enough to get married. He took out an insurance policy on Gaina within a first month or so. Tom then got into a bar fight with a shooting and a few people were injured, so she got a call from the police department. Someone that she knew at the police department told her about some of Tom's past that she knew nothing about. They asked about the life insurance policy and told her about the Utah situation with the murder of his second wife. Shortly after that, he was cleaning a gun and it went off. 
He was sitting at the dining room table and she was really close to him. She said all of a sudden it shot and there was a hole in the floor. And he said that he didn't even realize it was loaded. Not long after that, she packed up and left and went into hiding when he was at work. Now, during his marriage to Gaina, he, surprise, surprise, approached a friend, same old pattern, and asked if that friend would be willing to kill somebody for money. This friend's name was Glenn Morrison. Glenn Morrison lives in Columbia, Kentucky. So detectives packed up and headed out to Kentucky to go talk to Glenn. Glenn told detectives that Tom was really into guns and where he kept them, like he kept them pretty much everywhere. And he gave detectives information about how Tom mapped everything out with his plan to kill Gaina. He had the insurance policy and he wanted Glenn to come in, shoot his wife, and then shoot Tom in the leg. Again, this is the same thing that we heard about his plan with Mike Miller and with Eric Tarantino and his attempted plan with his old friend, Steve. Detectives move on to wife number five, Frances. Tom and Frances married in 1997. She has passed away now, but her sisters live in Indiana, so detectives went to speak to them. Their names are Carolyn and Hilda. Hilda said that Tom wanted to marry Frances right away. He pushed for it, so Frances had to get a divorce. So they married after about six months, and Frances had a heart condition that was serious, but not so serious that it required immediate surgery. But Tom convinced her that she needed to go ahead and get the surgery. She came out, she was in recovery, she was sitting up, eating, talking, everything was fine, and then something went wrong. Frances has a daughter named Rachel who describes her as the sweetest person that you would ever meet. She said that her mom moved in with Tom in Indiana, and so they all went and stayed there until they moved to Utah. He seemed like the picture-perfect dad at first. He got her into gymnastics and cheer and even taught her how to skate. She said that he was like a role model dad to her, but Tom and her mom would slowly start fighting more and more. She had heart surgery to get a valve replaced and she came out, she was doing okay. She was doing fine for days actually. And then one day Tom asked Rachel to leave the room. He said that he wanted her to give him a minute with her mom. She said about 45 minutes later, he came out and told her that her mom was dead. After that, Rachel said that he was on his knees and he hugged Rachel and was crying and said, not another wife. The doctors came in and asked Tom if he wanted an autopsy done on Francis. And Rachel said that Tom said no, because he doesn't want her cut into a bunch of little pieces. And then he had her cremated. Rachel said there is nothing right about that, that there should have been an autopsy. Rachel also said, what are the chances that she passed away while I was out of that room? Because I was just in there talking to her 30 to 45 minutes before that, and she was fine. Tom told Frances's sister, Hilda, that she died on the operating table. Her death was not ruled suspicious because it happened in a medical facility after surgery, but her sisters thought it was definitely suspicious. Her sister, Carolyn, said before she even went in to surgery that her face was swollen and she looked different. She felt like she might have even been being poisoned. Carolyn said, these women keep coming up dead and he keeps coming up with money. Tom actually profited from the life insurance on Francis and also turned around and sued the hospital and got money that way. They aren't sure of the exact amount, but her sisters think that it could be up to $1.2 million. Now, Frances's sister has a video of her where she's being coached by Tom on what to do and what she's saying. He's recording her saying what she wants for when she passes away. It's actually really eerie because she's saying what she wants when she dies, but then she said that she hopes that they basically make this tape and put it away and don't think about it again because she never wants to be without him. 
So on September 9th, about four months after Sharon's death, detectives have gone back to Clark County District Attorney's Office to show what they have to see if now they can get an arrest warrant. The case is complex because it requires witnesses from all over the place. There's Washington State, Indiana, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Utah, and New Hampshire. So the DA decides to take it to the grand jury. Now, Tom and Colleen have come to some agreements after arguments that Tom can go get some of his personal belongings from the house. Police and lawyers will be there when he goes, but Colleen did not want to be there, so her husband went. While at the house, they gave him a Markham notice, which is basically a notice of indictment. It just lets him know that there's going to be a grand jury looking into the case. So they tell him that he is being indicted for two counts of murder and conspiracy to commit murder. And he basically just said, okay, like no big deal. And he signed it and was allowed to leave. And that was that. Now, eight months after Sharon's murder, the grand jury comes back and they finally get the arrest warrant for Tom. So it's January 7th, 2009. Detectives go to Tom's mother's house in Clearfield, Utah, where he was living. He went to the door and officers went to detain him and told him that he's under arrest. But officers said that they noticed that he kept his right hand behind the door frame and he refused to show his hands. So officers tased him. He was arrested for the murders of Sharon Randolph and Mike Miller. They took him to the hospital because he said that he couldn't walk. So they took him for medical clearance and then he went to jail. Now, if you thought that all of this was wild, it's really just getting started. On the next episode, we will go over the trial and the many, many delays leading up to the trial, including 10 different attorneys and uh, I think the course of about nine years. So be sure to join in. Thanks so much for tuning in and please don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and leave reviews because that helps us get found. In the next episode, we will finish up the story that seems stranger than fiction and the defendant who seems more like a cartoon character. Then the new trial starts Wednesday and I will be giving updates on the podcast as it progresses. Thanks so much for reporting to Jury Duty. This is Brandy Churchwell and I will see y'all next time.